Well, good morning, everybody. And isn't it a lovely day today? And did you know that it's Advent Sunday today? The clue is on the board. Now, I want to start with a little story because I was in the, the shower at my house yesterday and um, I was praying about this service today, about what God would want to say through this service. And I can only say that I had a sense of, of, of Jesus there in the shower. I can't put it any stronger than that. I just had a sense of the presence of the Lord in the shower. And it was just lovely. Now, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't happen to me very often. <laughs> Perhaps it happens to you all the time, <laughs> but it doesn't happen to me very often. It was just, just lovely. And it just made me think about what Advent is all about. It's about the coming of the Lord. And somehow, the Lord seemed to come to me in a special way. And I thought it would be really nice this morning to start off our service with words of faith, with a creed. So I wonder if you'd mind standing with me and sharing this creed together. But just before we do that, let's just have a prayer. Lord, we so thank you that we can celebrate Advent Sunday today and we can know the presence of the Lord in this place. Holy Spirit, come to us this morning. Come and bless us. Come and lead us. Come and make this service not just a religious ritual, but a service of joy and peace and love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So let's share this together. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're just going to play a short clip from a video about Advent Sunday.
we light our first Advent candle this morning, the candle to help us to remember the Christian hope that we have. Hope not in ourselves, but hope in our God and Father. Let's stand to worship God as we share these two songs together. came out of the shower, having had this Advent experience with, with the Lord, I picked up my one-year Bible, I use this most days, and um, just this lovely verse stood out to me, I hope it stands out to you as well, it's from actually the book of Daniel, and it says, Greetings, listen to my account of the wonders and miracles which the Supreme God has shown me. How great are the wonders God shows us. How powerful are the miracles he performs. God is king forever. He will rule for all time. And somehow that just seemed to come together with my Advent experience. And it was just lovely. So I hope you can sense that this morning. We're in the presence of the living God. Isn't that right? Yeah. And we're going to worship again. In Christ alone. <clears throat>
Please sit or kneel to pray. The special prayer for Advent Sunday. Almighty God, as your kingdom dawns, turn us from the darkness of sin to the light of holiness, that we may be ready to meet you in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And we share together in the gathering prayer on the projector. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins. That by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Amen. We now come to our time of confession, where we can, in a moment of quiet, bring before God our frailties, all the things we've done wrong, the things we regret saying. We're reminded that Jesus said. Repent, for the kingdom of God is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoings and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And in the name of Jesus and through the power of his blood, receive forgiveness of your sins today. Amen. Well, we have a special guest this morning. Uh, Bishop David, would you like to come and join me? Yes. Now, Bishop David uh, chose the first hymn, Jesus is King. And uh, in a moment I'll ask you why. Sure. <laughs> but first of all, um, Bishop David, I know that you're retired. Yes. Wonderful. We'll discover where you came from in a few moments. But why did you come to Hereford? Well, we spent our life moving away from our children and leaving them behind as I took up new positions. Yeah. So it seemed time to move back. So we had an option. We said to the children, who can find us the nicest place to live? And we've got our eldest living in Hereford and they found us a lovely house not too far from the centre, walking distance from everything. And there we are. And do you actually like Hereford and the Hereford Shire? Yeah, we're loving it. I have to say it was just about completely new to me. Yeah, it's okay. um, So it's a lovely surprise and it's been such a shame that during the last two years we haven't been able to enjoy that much of it, of course. Yeah, because we've been quite cautious and you know, yeah. staying out of circulation a bit. But yeah. uh, we love getting around, we do. And we can all tell you're a bishop because you've got your purple stuff. Oh, I came with it's a flash, plenty of purple, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so tell us where you were bishop of and that sort of thing. I was bishop of Huntingdon, so that's the assistant bishop for the Bishop of Ely, which covers Cambridgeshire. Complicated, isn't it? So I spent a lot of time in Cambridge, but also going up into the Fenland, north of um, Ely and Cambridge. Mm. And, and really, it's a diocese of two halves. You've got this world city. And everything happening at packed churches in Cambridge, and then you've got this almost desert of landscape, which you know until 1700 was just bog. Yes, because it was the Isle of Ely, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, on the day. So I had a big heart for um, all those people up in the north of the diocese, even though I've got an academic background and was very at home in Cambridge mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. So what led you to becoming a priest, David? Did you? Were you always in the faith, or...? Well, 
um, as with Gina, our fathers were both clergy. Oh. Um, so, you know, you can remember, you can imagine, you know, when I was about this high, someone would come up to me in church and say, are you going to go into the church like your father? I learnt later on that the right answer was, I've already been baptised and I'm a member of the church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the thought was always there, but really plan A was to be an academic and I, I did do a doctorate and, uh, you know, taught and all the rest of it, but, um, you know, for, for one reason or another, it became clear that that was a little bit of a dead end. And while I've carried on doing academic work by night, I, I looked around for what did God want me to do by day. I looked at some of the big charities, but really they just wanted fundraisers, and that wasn't yeah. me. Um, yeah. And eventually, um, I think, you know, <laughs> to Jean's surprise, probably mine, uh, um, inquired about ordination and... Um, it just all happened from there. Was, was faith always in your heart from... Oh yes, I, I think, I, I can't really remember a time when I didn't have what you might call a, a fairly solid conventional faith. But like everybody, I've had times when that didn't mean very much to me and, and times when it came alive. I can remember one time at university, you know, feeling very proud of myself, I've got a scholarship and all the rest of it, a, mm. a special room, and I looked out at the night sky and I thought, David Thompson, what a little brat you are, compared <laughs> with the majesty of God. Yes. You know, and then there were times when you know, the Holy Spirit was big, and times when the Bible came alive. And yeah. So when people ask me about my churchmanship these days, I say mongrel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well <laughs> said. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, um, you, your wife is here with you. Jean, yes. Jean, thank you for coming. We, we really welcome you. And uh, how many children have you got? You've got four children and five grandchildren. So well, the clan is growing. Yes, I've got five as well. <laughs> so there you go. And I guess that you did better than your father because was he a bishop? Um, I wouldn't say better is the right word. <laughs> <laughs> I was kicked downstairs. Um, you, you remember what the great theory is, you are promoted to the level of your incompetence. <laughs> they get rid of you by pushing you upstairs. Yeah, he, he was a parish that. priest for, for all his well, life. That's, lovely. that's really good. And why did you choose the first hymn, Jesus? Yes, um, well, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a darn good tune, tune, isn't it? And it's got hope in the first <laughs> line. But then I looked at it and I thought, well, you know, is there more to think about from that? And I thought, um, I'm a fairly, I don't know about you, I'm a fairly anxious person. Mm. And so this hymn, I thought, says to me that there is hope. Because yeah. I don't feel like you're and don't think there is. Um, where to find it? with Jesus our priest interceding for us, and then what to do with it, lay our lives before him. So I thought it nails it really, doesn't it? We'll have that one. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you very much indeed. That's lovely. We'll be calling you forward in a few moments. Sure. I think you also have a clap, don't you? <laughs> this, is, this, is not, this is not, this is your life. Please come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's lovely, isn't it? Our church warden, Roger, is going to come and uh, do our Bible reading for us. He, just before he does his, the Bible reading, he's going to give a, a notice or two. Roger. Good morning, everybody. Um, apologies for uh, disturbing the flow slightly with a couple of mechanical things. Um, the first, of course, is Omicron. Um, we haven't yet had guidance from the uh, Church of England as to what's going to happen, but we are freely expecting that the wearing of masks and things will become obligatory soon. Mm -hmm. And you will notice that we have, people have ignored them studiously, but it hardly matters this morning, trying to keep alternate pews, as it were, alternate rows of seats free. And I think we'll probably try to enforce that more in the future. So we'll be following the Church of England guidance, but as uh, I was just, and, and come on behalf of the, of the, of the laity here also uh, um, welcome Bishop David. It's been lovely to see you here. He last preached here, but was it at the folk festival service? We invited yeah, well, him. Well, well. And, and it was jolly good too, I'll tell you. Um, two quick things. First, Jean's funeral, Jean Jacobs' funeral, is on Tuesday at 11.30 here. All are very much welcome. And afterwards at the Falcon, isn't it, Jane? So where we will be um, remembering her, talking to each other. And um, I've been asked also, because she was such a keen folk dancer, 
I'm going to be playing some folk dance tunes there as well on my squeeze box. So don't be surprised and think how peculiar. Um, and the other thing is that there's a wedding next Saturday here, which will be taking place in the chancel, which will be, it's a lovely space up there. So if you come in and wonder why the chairs have all moved, that's why it is. And lastly, the works in the church are going to commence first week in January, um, which means that we will all be moving into the chancel as and from, I think, the second Sunday in January, sorry, in January, the second Sunday in January. So don't be surprised also to find things changing very rapidly. Um, thank you very much. Uh, one more notice. Um, Roger and I and Roger are all trustees of Food for All, which Pam initiated, as you all know. And we're really excited because Frank and Betty and the two children are moving in there this week into what was Pam's old flat yes. above Food for All. It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Shall we just pray? Would you like to come forward? We would just pray a blessing on you all as a family. That'd be really great. If you don't mind. Sorry, not given much choice, really. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we just? Pray? Isn't it lovely? So the moving house into Pam's old flat. Uh, you're starting today, aren't you? Yeah, we start today, but we are working hard from August, yes, Roger, <laughs> uh, on this, and, yeah. and we are very thankful to, to moving Pam's flat, and, and we will try to save and continue Pam's legacy, yeah. we, we promise, mm -hmm. and, and we can't wait to, to help in the Food for All bookshop, mm -hmm. and, and we can't wait to... Uh, being a, being a part a little bit deeper in the community. So Lord, we, we pray now for this, yes, absolutely. We pray now for this lovely family as they move into their new accommodation. Thank you for the vision that you gave to Pam those many years ago, which is now being realized in a completely different way with Frank and Betty and the two children. So Lord, place your blessing on them as they move today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you uh, to everyone who worked very, very hard in the last few months on the flat and, and we are in our free future life. <laughs> thank you so much. Great. The Gospel reading is taken um, from the Gospel of Luke, um, uh, chapter 21, verses 25 to 33. There will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for their heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the leaves. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you this truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ, our Lord. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Very apt him. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand to worship.
Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your wisdom and insight. Mm. Help us to listen carefully to what you are saying to us. So let it lodge in our hearts yeah. and live in our lives. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I wonder when you were last down in London, or well, not all travelling around as much as we were before, um, and perhaps you went on the tube. Do you remember, at least in the old days, what they used to shout as you were getting on and off the tube? Mind the gap! Mind the gap! Yeah, mind the gap. Advent starts today. It's a time of waiting and getting ready for Christ at Christmas. But as we saw in the little video clip, it's also a time of waiting for the second coming of Christ, when the whole map of the world will be rolled up, and Christ will make all things new. And we live in the gap between these two comings of Christ. The promise is made, Christ has come, but the promise is also yet to be fully fulfilled. Christ will come again. Living in the gap is not always a comfortable experience, any more than it would be if you did end up in the gap when you're getting on the tube train. I said earlier to Wallace that, you know, I, I'm a fairly anxious person, and certainly these last months and couple of years now, have given many of us cause for anxiety, and there's plenty in the world around us to um, drive those feelings in us anyway. And you know, perhaps there are some sort of tiggers out there who sort of never feel anything like that and just bounce through life, but I think quite a lot of us do feel the weight of worry. Yeah. So how can we have a heart of hope, to again pick up the first of our four Advent themes, how can we have this heart of hope when our human nature often leads us in a different direction? How can we not be driven and paralysed by our anxieties, but live in the light and hope of Christ? So I was pondering this because it's you know, quite a personal thing really. You know, how, how can I not give Jean such quite, quite such a hard time by being more moody and worried? And I thought, well, what is hope? Hope is more like faith than knowledge, which is what came to me. If I know something, you know, um, a light has stopped working, I know to check the circuit at all the points, you know, has the fuse gone, has, has it gone off at the mains, is it the bulb, and if I swap them out one by one, I know how to fix it. Hope isn't like that. I can't think my way through to having hope. At least I can't. Maybe you can. I don't think we can, actually. I don't think we can manufacture hope. Mm. People who manufacture hope, well, you know, without going too deep into politics, there are some pol politicians who are very good at boostering. In other words, they proclaim hope, but actually, when you try and join up the dots, there are a lot of gaps missing. And we fall into the gaps. So hope is more like faith. I trust, for some reason, that the dots will join up. That all of this life will lead to a good conclusion. That those things which are rubbish now will be made well. How can I find that trust that I won't fall into the gap and the dots will join up? And that the boost is a real one? So we won't lift our hands and we're praising, we're worshipping. We're not just saying things, but actually we're proclaiming truths which we can dare to live our lives in. So Paul must have felt, I think, a little bit like this because he talked about hope in much the same way. He said in Romans, we have hope on the basis of what we have seen. We can hope for what we have not seen. On the basis of what we have seen, we can have hope for what we have not yet seen. And that's the way of living in the gap. 
in order to reach out to that which we haven't yet seen, and none of us has yet seen the second coming of Christ, we reach back and realise that we have been shown, and you know, a bit of an academic historian, as a matter of historical record, we have been shown the first coming of Christ. Mm. That is just real. Yeah. So we look back at that, and on the basis of that, we dare to project forward and say, if that's true, then I think it's very likely, I will hope with some reason, that the end of the story will be true in the same way as well. And what is the basis? What are we looking back at? Well, it's quite simple. You know, amongst, you know, amongst all the fog of things that we say and do in church and read and the rest of it, it all comes back to Jesus Christ in the middle. That's who we look back to. It's not so much a what as a who. We look back to Jesus. And I want to imagine that you are getting out your Bible and looking at it with fresh eyes as a result of what I've just said. Well, actually, what do we know about Jesus? I don't know if that's anything you've ever done recently. Somebody, I was just reading on the internet this morning and has launched a little campaign to say, um, you can read through Luke's Gospel, a chapter a day, it'll just take you nicely to Christmas. And you could do that thinking, I'm just going to have my eyes open in a fresh way to see, well, what do we know about Jesus from the Gospels? And you might think, well, actually, I'm going to learn about his birth and all the wonder of that. But I'm also going to look at his life and the character he showed in that life and the way he so impressed people that they gave up everything to follow him and the crowds gathered. I'm going to look at his character in the way that he was able to meet and forgive people that other people would just shy away from and extend that unconditional love of God so widely and cut through the fog of religion to the hope of salvation. I'm going to look at his willingness to embrace death. I'm going to look at his suffering. I'm going to look at his resurrection. I'm going to actually write down on a bit of paper in the back of the Bible his promises. There is so much that we can re-excavate, refresh in our minds. You know, I have a, you know, I suppose I read a couple of passages from the Bible every day. I have the Bible open on my desk. Um, I have prepared sermons so it's open for work. But still, you know, I really bear witness to sort of experience Wallace was talking about. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's all that time that's jumping off the page at me. But sometimes it does. Hmm. Because it's alive. You know, when I ordain people, I have to give them a Bible. And, and, and what you perhaps can't hear from the back of the cathedral is that is, is I hold it out to them, I'm daft, you know. I hold it out to them like this, slightly shaking, I say, be careful, it's hot, it's alive. Hmm. So, maybe a first takeaway point for this sermon is, see if you can let the Bible come alive again a little bit, this Advent, so you know what you're looking back to, so you can trust for what you're looking forward to. Jesus is the rock we keep coming back to. After all, we call ourselves Christians. We're named after him. Even if it's a little bit embarrassing to say Christ and call Christians, you know, let, let, let's be bold. Let's embrace Jesus Christ. Okay, let's move on from that. Let's just put alongside that the some people at that point, I think, would go straight into boostering. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You know. But, but I'm, I'm not like that. I do want to just go back at this point to those fears and worries and that it's not always easy. Because as soon as we, as we refresh our picture of Jesus, that is not going to stop the fact that when we then turn on the news, we're going to hear, oh, the Omicron variant. Oh, here we go again. Hmm. And isn't it like that every day with the news at the moment? You know, it's Omicron or it's the channel or it's climate change. You know, the world is a pretty grim place. Um, and it's no comfort if it's a historian, I say, and so it always was. Because it bears in on us. And at those times, it's very easy 
to feel the absence of God. Because in the gap, we haven't yet felt the full presence of God on that continuing, immediate basis that we're promised one day will be our blessing. So, second thought is, I wonder whether you can help me and I can help you not to be derailed every time we hear a bit of news which is threatening or worrying. What can we do? Because I think we have a choice of either megaphoning the worry, you know, and I worry to you and you worry to me, and, or pretending that worry isn't there and we, we don't talk about it. So is there, is there a middle way in that gap? But we can be honest about the worries, but also do the right thing with them. Well, if we've excavated Jesus a little bit from the Bible and begun to sort of just sense that presence of him, maybe in the shower, maybe not, um, wherever it happens for you, the obvious thing, the second take-home thing to do is to take those issues into our prayers, to talk to Jesus about them, as you might put it. So that if tomorrow morning or tonight the news is, um, oh, we've examined the Omicron virus and it, it's very transmissible, and you start thinking, oh, does that mean, is that a worry? You know, no. Close the newspaper, turn the television off, and talk to Jesus about it. Hmm. Look, you know, let Jesus, th this is your world, you know, you know more about this than I do. Probably some of these horrible things are true, and some are not, but you know. And I'm feeling really worried. I want to bring my worries to you. Please speak peace into my heart so that I don't become a retransmitter, a megaphone for the worry and give everybody else a really, really hard time. So we're real about the worries. We do things, we put our masks on, we're sensible. We don't pretend it's not there. But we don't become taken over. That's my prayer for me anyway, because I know I can get taken over. But I know that on a good day, remembering to say my prayers, there's a circuit breaker, to pick up another phrase that somebody uses, which stops that just running around in circles and becoming a, a black hole for me. As we do that, then there's also talk these days of saving Christmas. I, I tend to say to people, no, you've got it the wrong way around. We don't save Christmas. Christmas saves us. Um, Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. As we take our worries and concerns back to God, we discover the reality of Jesus being with us. And what a way to live our lives if we can, at least some of the time, and it won't be all the time. I agree with you, you know, I, I too. It's not... It's not every minute of the day that I sense Jesus sitting, standing next to me. You know, I probably wasn't brought up to think in quite those personal emotional terms. But time and again through my life, I've known its reality and enough that I can join up the dots and know that Jesus really is with me, seen or unseen, felt or unfelt, walking next to me. You know, that old footsteps prayer, Lord, where were you? You know, when I was having a hard time and there used to be two foot sets of footprints and now there's only one, where are yours? And he said, actually, I was carrying you, that's why there was only one set of footprints. Yeah. I mean, just to be personal, um, when I was training for ministry, one of those times when, you know, which I always remember, was um, our youngest, who had just been born, got Jim and measles, wasn't it, Jim? And from German measles, if you're an adult, you can get meningitis, it's the same virus. And I did. I've always had headaches and migraines and things. But I got the, the mother of all headaches. I couldn't move my why? The next thing I knew, I was being carried downstairs on a chair by ambulance people and taken to hospital. And be given lumbar punctures, and they're trying to work out was it bacterial, was it viral, because one's deadly and one's properly treated, treatable. That was a bit of a lie. Anyway, I was feeling so ill, I probably didn't take half of it in. And anyway, it turned out to be the sort which, you know, with antibiotics, would be treated. But I, I was lying there. Any light at all was deadly painful. So I was in the dark, 
And all I could really remember through the fog of all of that was the Lord's my shepherd. Yeah. And enough of the words from it. You know, probably having sung it so many times. And that was Jesus with me then. Yeah. And he saw me through. Very good. Saw me through. And those, then when later in life, having trained, I was taking funerals and we were singing the Lord's my shepherd. It wasn't just him, was it? I knew that the Lord was also the shepherd next to those people sitting in the pews of Prince William. I could speak from heart to heart. That God in Jesus can join up the gaps, the dots in the gap. He will be with us all the way. We look back and we see the truth of it then. We sense enough of it in our presence to be able to believe and trust with a full heart that he will be with us all the way. And that is hope indeed. Amen. Amen. Bishop David, that's excellent. Thank you. Strangely enough, when I had my stroke three or four months ago and I landed up in Hereford Hospital, the one thing that came into my mind as I lay in the bed was actually the 23rd Psalm. And it gave me enormous comfort, so I can really empathise with what you're saying. Um, I don't know if anybody else would like to make any comments. You can do it now or you can do it at coffee time. You're very welcome to make a comment if you'd like to. Any takers? No, we'll leave it till coffee time. Uh, Christine, would you lead us in that intercession? together. Our loving God, we thank you for the hope that you have given to us in Jesus Christ. He brings meaning and purpose to our lives and the promise of a future that the world cannot give, nor understand it seems. On this Advent Sunday, we fix our eyes upon you, Jesus. Whatever circumstances we are struggling with in this world, we know that you alone can bring healing and comfort. You alone can bring us assurance as we go through the darkness and into the kingdom of your light. So let's encourage one another as we walk on together in faith and hope and love. May the name of Jesus be on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> so let's bring to the Lord in prayer some of these anxieties that we hold on to, some of the things in this world that make us um, unstable, shall we say. And Lord, once again, we're facing the threat of a new variant of COVID. We recognise it's not just this country, but across the world that people are having to deal with it. And I want to pray for those who use their medical and scientific knowledge to fight this virus and keep people safe. We thank you, Lord, for their determination and their tenacity. Lord, we just pray that you will help them to keep that 
um, energy as they go into yet another phase of this virus. Hmm. And I want to pray especially for those people who feel burned out, emotional, emotionally burned out with just the pressure that they've experienced in these past months. And yet they still have to find the resources to care and to nurse others. Lord, we thank you for them. And we pray that they will have a deep sense of peace to help them in all they will face in the coming days. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. I'm sure that you will have been shocked, as I was, by the so much loss of life among the migrants, mm. men, women and children. We've seen pictures of them, Lord, crossing the channel in overcrowded and unsafe boats. And it's just so hard for us to grasp the desperation that they feel, to take the risks that they do to find safety and refuge. Oh Lord, our heart goes out to the individuals. Lord, that we see them as individuals, not just as migrants. But Lord, we pray that some solution may be found to help these people to find a permanent home and build a new life. Lord, through all the struggles they're experiencing, we ask that they will be touched by the love of the Lord Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. And now I want to pray for some individuals that we have on our hearts at this time. We've already prayed for Betty and Frank. And Lord, we just pray that your spirit will go with them into their future. Mm. I would want to pray especially for Alan and Penny and the family. Mm. Lord, we ask that your gracious presence surround them and strengthen them. Mm. We remember Jean Jakeman whose funeral is on Tuesday. And we thank you for her and for her faithfulness, her faithful service here at St Peter's. We pray for her family at this time. Lord, thank you that we met her and knew her and shared our faith with her. We pray for Clive and Deb and for a way forward for them and for the church. Lord, we're at that point that we hardly know what to pray for, but we just bring this situation to you. Lord, you can find a way. And with you, there is hope. No. Let us just have a moment of quiet and you can bring to the Lord those situations which make you feel anxious and afraid for the future. And so, Lord, we come to that point of praying for ourselves. We need to pray for ourselves, not just for other people. And we just pray that you will <coughs> prepare our hearts this Advent, that we will indeed be prepared for what is to come. Lord Jesus, we thank you that as you came once, so you will come again. As you departed into heaven, so you will return in glory. When your kingdom shall be established and your victory be complete, 
So we look forward in confidence to that day when you will be all in all. Amen. Now let's join our voices in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Call us again. The cornerstone of our faith, our hope, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's stand and worship with this uh, lovely worship song, Cornerstone.
banned by John Newton. And you remember, may remember he was a slave trader without any hope or reality in his life of that sort. And of course he became the vicar of Olney in Northamptonshire. And so it just seems very apt to finish our service with his lovely hymn, Amazing Grace. <coughs>
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. And now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. But please do join us for coffee at the back of church and chocolate biscuits or whatever happens to be there this morning. And thank you so much for coming this morning.